It's all about diversity this week. This is The Focus Group. It's the savvy side of 9 to 5. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. <laughs> and learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is The Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S-T-A-U-N-C-H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. Welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Tim Bennett. Visit focusgroupradio.com to learn all about the show, the platforms we're on, including audio and video. And if you're watching us on Facebook Live or YouTube, uh, by all means, feel free to join the conversation at 877-962-6846. And at focusgroupradio.com, you'll also learn about our other audio podcast. It's done on Tuesdays. It's called Unbuttoned. A L- little under 20 minutes, and it's a little more uh, newsy. Tim and I usually pick three articles that caught our eye that, that the beginning of the week, and we tackle those. Thank you all uh, f- who have been listening and downloading. It's greatly appreciated. So stay with that program, because we, we really like Unbuttoned, and we know you guys do too. So this week, um, the Out and Equal Workplace Summit is going on in Seattle, Washington. Uh, it started on Monday, and it runs through Thursday the 4th, I think, 4th or 5th. Whatever that date is. <laughs> we were there last year in Philadelphia. We were there uh, at the Volkswagen booth. We had uh, the pleasure of interviewing some of their executives and uh, talking to some of the conference attendees. And for those who don't know, Out and Equal Workplace Summit is a gathering of HR department uh, folks and employee resource groups and those involved in, in, in diversity and staffing and other issues surrounding equality in the workplace. Um, years past, the discussion has revolved around um, inclusion, same-sex partner benefits, things like that. I think this year the topic that seems to be dominating everything is uh, trans inclusivity uh, or dealing with people that are trans in the workplace and, and what that means. We're going to be going later on in the broadcast down to Herndon, Virginia, to actually be with some of our Volkswagen executives in what I consider to be one of the perfect buildings for an auto manufacturer because the entire ground floor is a showroom, which I love visiting. Museum, John. It's a, is it a museum? Museum. Well, I know that they're new cars, but there's also... Well, on the other side, the Audi stuff is all... Uh, oh, like famous like sports cars and stuff. Yeah. And we're going to be talking to a number of uh, people from their employee resource group down there, and also a favorite of ours in the focus group, Michelle Williams. Yeah, I was trying to think. I think this is Michelle's seventh or eighth appearance. On the show. And every time it's different. She yeah. has something new to say and something new to bring to the table. She's so. one of our most frequent guests. She so is. She knows the drill. In fact, she probably has every color of sock that we've ever um, run because we always give her socks yeah, you know, at I didn't the end of the that. show. But she probably has the blue pair, the black pair, the purple pair, green, red. She's green, red, <laughs> yeah, blue, black, yellow. Yeah, we had a lot of them. I, I found a, a, a photo of all the different socks. I, I, I was, you laid them out? Yeah, I, I used to have it as our cover page at Facebook. Oh, I do remember that now. Yeah, that was a long time page. ago. I'm, I'm going to have to post that again. Something different to change it up. So we're not going to Seattle this year. No, no, we're going to be. Um, to the Out and Equal uh, Workplace Summit. But um, I think in talking with the Volkswagen folks, you and I just had two different conversations this week about um, with senior executives at corporations where they do touch recruiting or um, I guess recruiting, retaining talent, trying mm-hmm. to to, uh, to get people uh, to work for their organizations. And it's amazing how much has changed it's from fast. looks of resumes, from uh, how you actually recruit people. I just, the, the one woman I talked to, I, I had her explain to me again. She says now, and I don't know if you've heard this, that they have a computer essentially do the recruiting for the first two or three steps for a candidate, which I just thought was A, so impersonal, and B, just horrible because I thought so much about everybody's going to look good on paper, but there's so much about chemistry yeah. with the people, or are you going to fit the culture? Are you part of the team? Can you? But she be, said yeah. they send this questionnaire out. They they scan the people apply, whether it's through LinkedIn or whatever. They apply for the job, and then the computer pulls out the keywords or whatever, and then they do a webinar. Which there's nobody hosting the webinar thing. They get in there and they go through a it's series like a video of, that plays. of questions. Somebody's talking. The computer's talking to you. Answer these questions. How would you answer this? How would you do that? 
And she said that you really don't get to talk to a live person until you're about four steps in. Which I just think is... Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so forget about the trans issue. Yeah. <laughs> and bisexuality. Just alone, that alone, yeah. <laughs> So Tim is bringing up something interesting because we're we're on in the process of revamping what I call our pass our business passports, you know resume, LinkedIn profile, letter of introduction, things that everybody should have and keep up to date. But a lot of us don't, and I'm guilty as all guilty. sin for not having yeah. this guilty as charged. And my sister turned me on to a woman who. Uh, is a professional resume writer and my sister also shared with me with the results of her work with this woman and I sent it to Tim immediately and we were both like is this what things look like now <laughs> and it really and my sister in her note to me said hey by the way don't react to the design of things because guess what they've changed and true to form a friend of mine asked for advice uh, this weekend for a, a, an associate of his who's looking for a job and he said I'll send you her resume and he sends it and I call it up, and I was looking through a prism right back to 1991 or 92. I mean, it was the exact format that we were taught. You know, don't stray from this. It's bullet, bullet, bullet. It's title. Accomplishments. Year, it's, yeah. Right. Title, accomplishments, results. And honestly, after looking at my sister's redone and revamped uh, version, I will say that um, the older version doesn't even come halfway near telling you what my sister can accomplish for you based on just a quick glance of that new format. So I guess it's evolved. If you Google it, if you Google resume format 2018, you're going to be shocked by what you see. Well, if you're, if you're like me, you were shocked by what you see. <laughs> Graphs and charts. When's the last time you did a resume? Probably when I was 21. Student work, student, student work, work, student work. Tim's bringing up a, a bad interview I had at CBS at Black Rock up on 55th Street, I think. The woman did not want to interview me. She was doing a favor to an art director whose daughter went to school with me, and she slaps my portfolio down one of those. Did she have a cigarette? That would only, that'd be, if she, she had was, a cigarette She did smoke, and back like in the day, they That smoked. would have been the best thing. Student she's work, like, student work. She's like, let's look at what you brought. <laughs> the zipper was for the portfolio, and then she starts flipping through, and she goes, student work, student work, student work, student. And I'm in my little cheap gray suit and my polyester red tie, sweat and gumball singing. It was a nightmare. Did you get the job? No. And no, then, she, then she th throws the book closed and she says, you know, <laughs> what, uh, what turns you on? You know, what turns you on as a person? And I'm like, and, she, and I start saying, well, hanging out with my friends and, and going to movies. Yeah, hang out. She was like, this, hang out with my friends, going to movies. And she was like, dinner. parroting it back to me. And <laughs> when I left, I was so demoralized. I mean, really demoralized. And, and I vowed to never, ever put myself in that position again, which may be one of the impetuses for starting my own company because I couldn't believe someone could be that nasty. Sure. Later on, I found out that she was having a super bad day. Oh, please. Um, and she went back to the art director that had asked <laughs> her to review the book and to interview me, and she said, I think I was really bad to that guy. And, and then I think the answer was something like, well, he's just getting out of college. He'll be fine. Yeah. He'll bounce back. Yeah. So, He'll be fine. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and as, as I was talking, uh, John and Garrett, thank you, John and Garrett, running everything in the booth. We have uh, Garrett on audio, John on video. What's, they were, what's that yes, posting? they were looking, they, John just went online, and that's what resumes look like now. So there's color. I don't know. Do you include your picture? You could. It's like your LinkedIn profile, right? Mm. But just like LinkedIn, there's little boxed items. Here's your skill here, here's your skill there. See, so you, you would really have to know what you, you can't do that yourself unless you're pretty smart. To do all the with design. all that formatting, yeah, yeah design. exactly. That's like that's like, like using in design Adobe's in design. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a that's a skill as well. I like how it's bracketed. Yeah, so I think you get an idea that this is a buttoned-up candidate from this sample they they uh, pulled up, and that see how they graphically represent things. Like clearly English, she knows because she's got like four or five boxes checked there. Spanish is good. French, eh, she could probably order something. Bonjour, ça va, ça va bien. Oh my God. See all that nonsense on the right where, where she says she did uh, uh, all the classes she took? Yeah. Or, or, I, I could probably have four pages of those. Well, it, depending on your age and your... You know um, what I mean? So yeah. you gotta, I guess you have to... It's all different now. That's what I'm going to say. So, on with the show. What caught your eye? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Well, this doesn't have anything to do with work, but it has to do with marriage. 
I guess. Okay. So this was a bride and groom is, and this is the the Brits have a way with language. Bride and well, groom. Marriage is a contract. It could be like that's a that's business. True. <laughs> this is bride and groom being rinsed for a ridiculous list of rules they sent their guests for the wedding. So there's been a, everybody's seen in the in the uh, in the papers or the trades. You hear about these wacky wedding stories of people that mm -hmm. have these destination weddings and all this stuff. So they gave a couple of examples, and then they go through this list that was sent out to all these attendees at this wedding a couple weekends ago, and they they shared it, which which I thought was quite funny. But they gave a couple of examples. There's one one bride spent one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on five different wedding ceremonies, and then she went and demanded guests spend five thousand dollars for a trip to Nigeria for the wedding. I wouldn't go. Would you go? Wow. Wow. That's crazy. There was another woman in Canada who wanted every guest to pay $1,500 so she could have a fairy tale wedding. Most people refused, so that didn't happen. <sighs> Imagine making these demands. Another bride canceled her ceremony after the guest refused to spend $3,000 for a destination wedding, another one of these destination weddings. And then there's this um, letter that went out. So this obviously went out from the wedding coordinator. And the person, <laughs> the person who sent it out said, um, these were a list of rules and reg regulations, very rigid rules and regulations for those attending the couple's wedding. They said the entire piece, it was included in the invite or whatever, it was riddled with spelling errors. <laughs> and they, they, riddled. Said, they said, but it didn't detract from the baffling rules. So they, so they left the rules in. Or they left all the spelling errors in to share it. So the first rule was you needed to arrive 15 to 30 minutes earlier, not sooner, not later. It had to be within that 15 to 30 minute time frame. Do not wear in big letters white, cream, or ivory. I'm assuming that's because bride and bridesmaids had those colors locked up. You know, you <laughs> for women, do not wear anything other than a basic bob or ponytail. Please do not have a full face of makeup. And they spelled it, please do not have a fave full face of makeup. So they did fave F instead of the H. Um, do not record anything during the ceremony, spelled with an S. I've heard that from other weddings too, yeah. Do not check, it, do not check into Facebook until instructed. And when you do check in, you're to use the proper hashtag for all photos. Everyone's to use the same hashtag. All in caps, do not talk to the bride at all at any time. <laughs> but it's a part, it, oh my God, seriously? Everyone will toast with Remy, no acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, you must come with a gift worth $75 or more or you will not be admitted in. If you need clarification, please call me. Thank you very much. I have never heard of such a thing. John, you're getting married soon, do you have rules? Nothing like that, no, just that. Come and have a good time. I mean, that's insane. <laughs> My gosh. I've, I've wow. seen, I know a couple people that, and I do agree with this, there are, there's some people I know that got married that um, their families asked people not to be having their cameras and phones yes, out and everything. I, I perfectly so I think it's acceptable. They yeah. said we have a professional photographer there. You can go on the site later. He's, get the he, pictures. He or she's going to catch all the, capture all the pictures. We don't need all the distraction of people's phones and everything going off. I get that. But um, can you imagine, if I got something like that, I'd be like, you know, I'd have a nice wedding. <sighs> the, the hairstyle thing, mm -hmm. I'm kind of caught on. <laughs> Bob or ponytail? <laughs> yeah, I kind of, I kind of like a, a record hitting, a, a, a tone arm hitting a groove on a record player. I'm kind of caught on that one. Like, because if that's your normal hairstyle, you're basically being told you can't show up like that. I went to a, a same-sex wedding, and the, the request, the one request they had was everybody had to wear white, which I hated. I don't think people look good in white. And it was not everybody. Rain. Not everybody. Okay, there we go. And yeah. uh, but we were all in white. I bought white clothes that I wore once. You bought white clothes. Hey, look that what I, I don't have white pants. I look like the yeah. good humor man. The, the wedding I went to in August for my friends uh, Lucas and Steph. Um, no rules at all. Only rule: come to party and. Gifts were not even thought about because most of their guests were traveling. Right. So they courteously thought, if you're spending the money to show up. Don't even bother. Make people travel around. Yeah. Wow. So what caught your eye? Um, different. Perhaps it is a diversity caught your eye, but it's an animated one. And uh, if you're familiar with the Disney movie Wreck-It Ralph, which is actually one of my more favorite movies of the CG um, animated category, and it came out of Disney Animation, Wreck-It Ralph 2 is on the horizon, and Disney recently weathered a backlash over uh, a scene that was released, a couple of pictures of what was happening in the movie, and it revolves around something, a woman named, well, a character named Princess Tiana. So Princess Tiana is the first African-American 
Disney princess introduced into their canon of films, and it was in 2010's The Princess and the Frog. And that was a hand-drawn animation, you know, like uh, what we grew up with. Uh, so this Wreck-It Ralph 2 is a CG, meaning it's computer graphics, and when they showed Princess Tiana in the, her environment, the internet went crazy because they had changed the look of the character. Her skin was lighter. According to everybody that was watching it, the skin was light. Her features were lighter. Uh, her nose was na more narrow, and um, she had a different hairstyle. So the picture on the left is actually the the newly redone version. That's Princess Tiana. So which one's Tiana? She's with a yellow crown. Okay. Um, now, if you go to the right, you're going to see her. She's on a couch behind. Uh, she's by, she's sipping coffee back there. Yeah, see how they changed her hair. She's not wearing the crown, and in fact, she does have lighter skin Cross tone. Side. Well, she's looking at. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Disney actually, there was a um, uh, a Twitter. Uh, 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 so there's the difference when you yes. do it that way. Okay. There was a Twitter um, campaign that was launched, and Disney very respectfully and quickly had some of the key players, and including the actress who voiced Princess Tiana back in 2010, and one of the lead animators actually explained to um, the group and to the group of people they brought in that the hand, the flat style animation hand drawn the ca the color of the character would remain consistent throughout the film because that was a paint. And that when they do CG, there are actually scenes where the lighting will affect the look of the character. And so it's hard to judge from a certain scene if that is, in fact, how the character is rendered. But then Disney took a, the further step of going and re-rendering the character and actually redoing parts of her for a movie that's actually most of it's, most of it's in the can already. And you're talking about many, many, many hours and, and hundreds, if not thousands of dollars of animator time to go in and fix Princess Tiana to be what people saw from 2010. So another example of um, unintended consequences, because I think the other thing that I read was the animators had no idea. They just thought, hey, let's put her in different hair. She's relaxed. She's hanging out with her friends. <laughs> and suddenly, boom. <laughs> <laughs> but they stepped up and they fixed it very quickly, so um, I think that's uh, kudos to Disney for that. But it does it, it does speak to the environment we're in, where you know I I don't know how you can future proof anything you do now, especially a film like this was begun three years ago. So you know that's a that's a hard call. So it sounds like it was a lighting issue and it was unintended, but somebody read more into it. It wasn't on Disney's part. To no, they they had no intention of changing the character from the first African American princess introduced into a film, but because of how they styled her for this particular CG film, like a pushback. They got a lot of pushback, and so they re, re they fixed that. Wow. Well, that is a diversity one, John. Yeah, there you go. Uh, there you in go. honor of out and equal. In honor of out and equal. <laughs> so our business birthday this week. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings. But the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. This is actually Thursday, October 4th would have been his birthday. He was born in 1923, Charles Philip Lazarus. He died in 2018 at 94 years old. He was an American entrepreneur, executive pioneer within the toy industry. You'll probably know him better as the founder of Toys R Us. And what's the theme song? I'm I don't want to grow up. up. Yeah. I'm a Toys R Us kid. <laughs> so he founded the company in 1948. It was originally a children's furniture store. So oh, whoa, 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 a ch children's furniture yeah, store. Yeah, he came back from World War II, and he was selling strollers and cribs and stuff. He had a, he had a relative that had a furniture store in D.C., in Adams Morgan. And uh, so he decided he was going to sell children's furniture. And what he found is once in a while he would he would bring in some new toys that he would have in the store. And he found that parents were really more interested. They're not going to buy another stroller or buy another crib, but they always wanted to buy, see what the new toy was because kids got, got tired of their old toys and wanted new toys. So he says, the toy business was kind of by accident. I started out selling baby toys little by little and then realized my customers didn't want to buy another crib or another high chair or playpen as the family grew, but they did want to buy more toys. So in 1957, he opened up the first Toys R Us in Rockville, Maryland. And uh, he said he purposefully wrote the R backwards to make it look like a kid did it. A yeah. small kid had, had written it. <laughs> it's cute. And he said uh, they, they expanded, as you know, they were a titan in the 1980s and uh, expanded overseas to the point where even George Bush, H.W., opened up the store in Japan in uh, 1992. And they created Jeffrey the Giraffe as the store mascot, the I'm a Toys R Us kid jingle. 
And uh, sadly, Lazarus retired in 1994, and then in 1998, Walmart surpassed Toys R Us as the largest toy retailer in the U.S., and like everything else, Walmart and uh, online and the internet has swallowed up Toys R Us, and uh, it no longer exists. They said uh, he died of respiratory failure on March 22nd at the age of 94, one day before liquidation sales began in the U.S. of all the Toys R Us. So he died one day before wow, liquidation. Wow, that is such a weird coincidence. Like, that's a strange coincidence uh, for that so being so close. Hey, I loved, when I was a kid, Toys R Us is where I, I went to. I a toy store. All, but you liked I a toy store, right? I toy stores. I loved I get my models there, my model paints. I was wondering if there's any independent toy stores. There are a few. Yeah. And you see them in little towns now and then. And I always go into one because you never know what you're going to find in there. You, it's kind of like the kid with a lemonade stand. You almost feel like you have to buy something to yeah. keep them going, right? Even if it's something small, I'll yeah. still buy it. Hey, as many of you know, uh, Deep Discount is a partner and friend of ours here on the Focus Group. Get to Deep Discount by visiting focusgroupradio.com, clicking on the shark logo. Arr, the shark on the right-hand side. Where's your puppet? Puppet is taking a... We can't do the puppet all the time. Oh, it's new. You new. want to have... Puppet can come in and out. and like surprise. the Costanza's on Seinfeld. It can be surprising. The puppet needs to be a surprise <laughs> and not an expected thing. So don't worry. We don't have the hand puppet I'm gonna today. I'm going to let Lauren know. <laughs> well, no. You, you know, you want to keep that joke going. So you have to, like, leave them wanting more, right? Yeah, like the Costanza's more, more on the, every episode. More of the shark puppet, yeah. So uh, this week at uh, Deep Discount is the biography sale. And... Uh, Biographies constitute movies about people or, you know, well, it's biography sale. So there you go. <laughs> Biographical film sale. Um, I picked as a movie that I, my mother loves. I loved it. I highly recommend it. I picked two, but I'm going to, I'm going to do a highbrow. The first one is The Lost City of Z. Highbrow. It's a fantastic movie. Um, it is about, let me get his name right because I've seen it twice now. I, Charlie Hume plays the lead. Uh, tells the incredible true story of British explorer Percy Fawcett, who journeys into the Amazon at the dawn of the 20th century and discovers evidence of a previously unknown advanced civilization that may have once inhabited the region. Um, and he was part of, back then, the original National Geographic Society in London, and, and so he, gets, he goes again and again to the Amazon and eventually doesn't come back from one of his trips, but it's a beautifully made film, uh, well worth the watch. So The Lost City of Z on Blu-ray. You're not doing the lowbrow. And then there was the lowbrow one I saw. Let's <laughs> give the name. It's called Greek Pete. Greek Pete gives us a glimpse into the world of Pete, a very popular escort voted best escort at the World Escort Awards in Los Angeles in 2008. And it follows his journey to be an escort to make some money. And That's when you buy and give away, pass around. Yeah. <laughs> Greek Pete. Think? Yeah, there you go. So, Tim, what would you pick? I picked the Royal Collection, which is a uh, a DVD box set, for only twenty two fifty nine, a deal at any price, really. I think four hundred and seven minutes long. It was in honor of the sixtieth anniversary of Queen Elizabeth II's coronation, and there's actually four different films in this, uh, or four different documentaries in this set. The first one is the coronation of Queen Elizabeth and gives the backstory of how she Any got... Any of these films I'm going to watch, I love this stuff. Well, and we love The Crown, yeah, right? So exactly. This, this is very timely. The other one is, um, so that was the first one, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. Then it includes King George and Queen Mary, the royals who rescued the monarchy. And it essentially is about the creation of the House of Windsor, how they more anglified themselves. I guess. And that probably took place during World War II, is right? Uh, it doesn't give a time, but yeah. I think, well, I think it was earlier, wasn't it? House of Windsor. Uh, no, King, King George is Elizabeth's uh, father. Father, right. Yeah. So that was abdication, the whole bit. But, you right. know. And then Queen Victoria's children looks at the tumultuous relationship between Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, and their children. And then the later one, How to Be a Prince, which uh, looks at how Prince William was raised different than all the other royals. royals and they use certainly an awful lot of footage with Princess Diana and how they're in stark contrast with how his father was raised. Very cool. Father. So this is a box set. So it's a box set. It's a 2259 DVD box set. And uh, this is the sort of thing where I know friends will have these, whatever, Some, if you're an Anglophile, some sort of party, they'll put these things on. And, I love it. You know, serve tea and crumpets and enjoy them. <laughs> I could always watch this. Okay, What's so. What's new release? A new release this week is Barry, the complete first season. And this stars uh, Bill Hader. I love him. And he plays Barry, who is actually a hitman who travels out to Los Angeles to take someone out. He follows him around for a bit and follows this guy into an acting class and falls in love with the acting class. In some ways, it reminds me of the plot line of Get Shorty, 
Remember where the gangster yeah. goes out to the West Coast and decides he's going to make a movie? Um, you know, Henry Winkler recently won, an, uh, was it a week or two ago with the Emmys? He won an Emmy for this, for his role in this. And it's supposed to be fantastic. I've heard nothing but good buzz about Barry. So that's on my list. It's going to be coming from Deep Discount. So that's the release of the week. And I do recommend it because I think we love him. Yeah. I last saw him in Documentary Now, which I adored. <laughs> so That's great. There you go. So uh, I recommended The Lost City of Z. Tim recommended The Royal Collection. I didn't know you Collection. were doing a recap. And the, the, the release this week is the complete first season of Barry, which is a show on HBO. And Garrett? Thanks, Deep Discount. <laughs> we were stumping our toes. I, I, was, I was trying to figure that one out. Hey, we want to, we're going to take a break, but when we rejoin you, we're going to be uh, down in Herndon, Virginia. And uh, we're going to be talking with Michelle Williams. And Michelle's been on the show before. As you know, she's the Senior Director of Diversity and Corporate Social Responsibility for Volkswagen Group of America. So we're going to talk to them and... Uh, have a great time down in Virginia, so stay with us. Brought to you by the Volkswagen Tiguan, the not-so-compact compact SUV. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. Welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash with my good friend and co-host Tim Bennett. We're here in Herndon, Virginia at the Volkswagen Corporate Headquarters, a true car company, as I always say, because the entire first floor, which you're not seeing all of, is in fact a showroom and we're sitting in front of some of their great cars. In fact, there's a Jetta just off camera. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> but on camera and most certainly in front of me and she got the memo today and the memo was? Blue. Blue. Blue, Volkswagen. Blue, blue apparently Volkswagen is blue the color kind of the day. Yeah. Kind of. Is one of our, um, I believe, most frequent guests? Yeah, Yay. at least in the top three. At least in the top three, we'll yeah. Double and, check. And I'm, I'm of course referring to the woman next to me, Michelle Williams, Senior Director of Diversity and Corporate Social Responsibility, Volkswagen Group of America. Michelle, welcome back. Thank you for having me. Now, last time you saw Michelle was in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. We were sitting in front of the Hero Color Tiguan, which was a red That's car. That's right. And you were the rose between two thorns. <laughs> so not much has changed in a year. It's nice to know when you travel around Earth like the sun <clears> once, <throat> nothing changes, nothing right? Nothing changes. But actually everything changes. And Michelle oversees the diversity initiatives at VW. And I have to say that with the the rapid change of everything. There are words we can no longer say. There are jokes we can no longer laugh at. I'm just generalizing this. No, no, it's true. Pronouns you can't use. Okay, pronouns yes. you can't use. And that's in the span of eight or nine months. Mm -hmm. What is the challenge of a corporation staying in front of this? Or do you even try to stay in front? Or are you just kind of always running to catch up? Well, <clears throat> I think there are some companies who are staying ahead. Most of us are just trying to keep pace. But I think the key for us has been, you know, listening to our employees and really keeping our finger on the pulse of what our employees are telling us they need from us and what they want from us. Because like you said, the, the American consumer in general now, we're in this place where we've, sort of, we've lost a little bit of confidence that our government's gonna solve society's problems. And now people are looking to their corporations to solve society's problems. And so it's not enough anymore to offer good benefits and good comp and all of that kind of thing. Employees today wanna know <clears throat> that the company they work for genuinely cares about them as a human being. They're whole. They're whole. You care about me and everything that's important to me. And you care about the community. And um, I read a Harvard Business Review article that was talking about the main reasons millennials are leaving their workplaces. Did you see that article? Yeah, I did. Now, why don't you, what is the main? So like, you know where I'm going yeah. with this. They, it's not money, it's not benefits, it's not vacation time or even flexible work, which we thought was the magic cure all a couple of years ago. Today, they will leave you if they feel your values don't line up with theirs. theirs. And so even though they're coming out of university with incredible amounts of debt, and you think they'd just be motivated to get paid uh, like we were, right? Just like <laughs> last century, yeah. I mean, you know, they're saying, listen, you know, I don't believe you, I don't believe in you, and I'm not working for you. So as a company, you sort of have to keep up with that. And 
we think we've done a fairly good job of having our corporate social responsibility initiative sort of mirror and match what our employees' passions are. We have lots of opportunities for our employees to give back to the community. And they tell us quite frequently through surveys and other feedback that it's one of the most important things to them about working here. Uh, yeah. So that's interesting. But you have to sort of, you know, you can't, you can't say, well, we have this diversity strategy, right? And we've got these pillars. Forget that. You've got you've to gotta keep your ears open, keep your finger on the pulse of what's important to people. I was surprised to hear that um, <clears throat> you guys have, is it 19 employee resource groups? We have a lot of employee resource lot groups. Of, oh yeah. <laughs> but I was, I was, I, you know, so close to the nation's capital, and you know how to answer with a, <laughs> yeah. with a non answer. I, I like that. Yeah. It depends around, on the man. week, depends on I've the day. I've only been here eight years, and this all I've already changed. No, I, I don't have the exact number. I know it's close to 20, so 19 right. might be the number. Um, and it exploded. It just exploded in 2000, and I want to say um, 15. But was that employee driven? You mentioned surveys or the employees telling you what they wanted. Was that employee driven or was it your group saying, you know what, we should do something for young professionals or for mm -mm. African American employees or Latino employees? Or was it something that the employees came to you and said, hey, by the way, can we start right. an ERG for? So it's a little bit of both. So okay. from a strategic perspective, we knew that best practice was to have these groups and organizations. The companies who perform best in terms of diversity have these opportunities for employees with like interests to come together. And so we were intent on making sure we made a space for that here. But we put the call out and we said, hey, everybody, employee resource groups are here. We want to hear from you. What do you like? And we had a women's group that was already functioning at the time, Women in Motion. And I think that was the only sort of established group we had. Um, people came forward, the young professionals uh, were probably the first group to come forward and they didn't even wait for us. Uh, so Why am I not surprised? Right? The young guns, the young guns, <laughs> young professionals. They were like, get out of our way, please, and thank you. Um, and so they've really sort of led the charge in this organization and they've been very innovative and they've been very practical and they have engaged everyone, not just young people. They let us old folks come along sometimes. <laughs> um, and then from there, you know, we had the Asian, the Oath group came along, the African-American group came along. We have uh, Hispanic groups. We have several women's groups all over the country, which is really kind of neat. Um, so lots of different chapters of in the LGBT drive group. And so and everyone, you know, at their, at their own journey, at their own pace, with their own passion, right, has sort of found their niche. And all of these groups now, the momentum is swelling. It's really quite fascinating. It's, um, it's very different than the, the, the work world I graduated into. Mm -hmm. not, not to fix myself too far back in the past. <laughs> But I'm that, right there with it, you. it's actually something you said earlier at the top of our discussion, which is you'd think when you graduated with your loans mm -hmm. and a list of things that have to be paid, you'd just be happy to be getting a paycheck, right. and let, we let were, alone worrying right? about, you know, like. Well, we were all, yeah, we yeah. were all contemporaries and that was what you did. That right? is and exactly I think that, what you did. That, and that, like, so that acceleration from even, from that change, from that mentality to where we're at now took a long time compared okay. to the last 10 months or even two years. Because last year when we talked to you, I was like, I said, I think I asked you a question about, um, does it ever get old or like, mm -hmm. what, and, you, and you said, no, diversity, the word itself is literally changing All on a time. daily basis practically. Mm -hmm. And even employee resource groups. So I think a couple of years ago, there was this thought that we wouldn't need them anymore, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that it was a passe idea that it's about all of us now, right? And that was two years ago, and then all of a sudden, the answer to that was a resounding, absolutely not. And now you've seen a resurgence, not just in our company, but all over the country. So it is a thing. It does ebb and flow. Um, but I think the companies that are going to be okay are the ones that are flexible enough to really just sort of listen to the needs of their workforce. I think that's very important. Is, is there a challenge with having, so if there are employee resource groups, they obviously meet during the day. Mm -hmm. And you, like most companies in America, are probably short on resources mm -hmm. in terms of people. Everybody's trying to be leaner and, and yep. leaner and, and work more efficiently. How do you convince the, the leadership within the organization that it's important for you to allow employees to participate mm -hmm. in an employee resource group or outside community activities? Is that, is that a challenge or is it culturally 
understood here? I think it was a challenge in the beginning because the unknown is always scary, right? And for some reason, maybe it's because people are a pair, I don't know what it is, but people always think that the wheels are gonna come flying off and people are just gonna run wild and crazy. Like when we started flexible work arrangements, people were like, well, there's never gonna be anybody <laughs> no one's here. here, no one's here. And, you know, Tumbleweed and blows yeah, through And the so office, it was right? kind of the same thing. Well, if we have all these people taking away from their jobs, well, first of all, number one, there's a lot of discretionary effort that happens. A lot of the activities and planning and the execution of that happens after hours. So people are that committed to it that they do spend discretionary time. But we've had some impact at a business level with our groups. Uh, businesses have used them as focus groups. They've used them to get insight into the marketplace. We have seen, um, you know, at a time when our company, when the morale was kind of low and we were taking some hits, we saw employee resource groups serve as that boon to morale and engagement. And so when leaders started to see the benefit that the groups were bringing to the organization, then they were willing to step up and say, not only is this okay, but you know, I'm, I want to sponsor one of those groups. I want to be one you, of those you, groups. Interestingly, you brought up a, the word, the, so you put business in there. Um, there mm -hmm. are companies that do not use the word ERG. Mm -hmm they use BRG mm -hmm. and they refer to them as business resource groups. And the notion is that, that they're gonna let your group exist if you can somehow motivate the bottom line or make a business case, make a business yeah. case for why. And that was never part of your thought process, right? No, because um, I think the, the business group um, trend that happened came as a result of groups needing to rebrand themselves. Because in some of the companies like Ford or you know Pepsi or those legacy Coca-Cola yep. companies where these groups had been existing since the 80s, they really were social clubs, right? right? And they <laughs> people were getting together and they were having happy we're hours. Gonna have massages, we're gonna and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so we <Beverage> <laughs> lobby B for a massage, cookies, and yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> and so there was this notion that it wasn't serious, that it wasn't about business. Um, I don't know if it's just the nature of our industry or the word German company. Our employee resource groups came out the gate impacting the business. In fact, we've had to encourage them <laughs> around the notion of community and social because they came out of the gate saying, how do we affect the culture? How do we impact the business? So we never had to rebrand ourselves. We were just, um, it's, it's, it's what's known about employee resource groups in our companies that we are helping the business. That, that came, that, that distinction I, I learned, I was at a listening uh, meeting that the new head of Out and Equal had, Aaron, oh, okay. yep. back uh, in the springtime. And it was an interesting conversation because many of the people in the room, the disgruntled half were part of the BRGs because they were literally being looked at by management as if you're using these resources, yes, a place to cut. Yes, to cut. Uh -huh. Whereas the ERG side was no, this is ERG's better because you know we know we're affecting the bottom line somehow by our positive attitude, by what we, we bring our authentic Absolutely. self to work, we talk about the brand. So again, it's it's I, I guess it's just such a fascinating thing. These are things we didn't even I don't even remember having employee resource groups no. when I was out of college. No. Well, the word okay. diversity wasn't used, no, or the word true. inclusion. And I, and I was going to ask, both you and John brought it up from the, your conversation last year. We had an author on. She's also a well-known marketing, niche marketing expert, Kelly McDonald. And she talked about the companies using the words, and I know it's in your title, diversity and inclusion. And she had said she really felt, and I'm curious as to your opinion, that diversity has often been used as a scold, sometimes out of HR. Mm -hmm. And it really was about race and, race and ethnicity versus inclusion, which might say, you know what, we, we, can, we can all look the same, but maybe I have a different religion, or maybe I have kids and you don't. Mm -hmm. And it goes beyond just simply, what does what somebody look see. like, what she can see. <laughs> what are do the you, commonalities? Right, do you, yeah. are you finding that's a trend, or how do you feel about the word diversity versus inclusion or something else? Well, again, I don't like to get cute with my words. I, that's, that's, I believe in calling what it is. It is what it, what it is. is. And I actually had someone approach me. They were looking for a chief happiness officer. And I said, please stop. Just stop with that. So here's the thing. Why do I see a, can it, why, why do I see a helium cylinder on a balloon and a red nose? The happiness yeah, guy. Hi, are you happy? Well, you've been around a while, though. I've you know Vol Listen. Volkswagens had some crazy titles back we, in the day. We have. Yeah. We have. I forget what the head of marketing used to be. It was like brand innovator. innovator or something, Some, yeah, was like, because what? these trends come and go, right? But, you know, the evolution of diversity was it started out being about 
righting the wrong. It started about, you know, complying with laws. Right the Civil Rights Act, the Disabilities Act, all those, you know, legal things. And then it became, well, hey, this is really the right thing to do. If people were feeling in their heart that they wanted to make it right. And then somewhere along, you know, around 2000 or so, people figured out, oh, wait a minute, African Americans, Asians, and Hispanics have a trillion dollars worth of spending power. Hey, there's some money Light to bulb. be made. Ding, 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 cha-ching, cha-ching, yeah. cha-ching. Cha -ching. <laughs> then all of a sudden it became, well, what's your business case for diversity, right? So then it became about oh, marketing and all of that. And I think what's happening now is we're evolving yet again to this idea that it isn't about singling out people's differences. What it is is about acknowledging people's uniqueness and then embracing how each of us is unique and how we can all come together and contribute. And that's where inclusion came. So the idea was just because everybody's invited to the dance doesn't mean everybody dances, right? right. There's that, all those things. Um, so inclusion then became the word, but here's the thing. You can't have one without the other. You can't be Nicely inclusive if, if everybody in the room is the same, Correct. right? Well, yeah, yeah. And, and if everybody's not there, then who are you including? So mm -hmm. to me, they're one and the same, and I don't generally like to get cute with my words. <laughs> I... So it's more of a stew than a melt. It's more of a stew than a melting pot, right? Sure. Because or if you look at a stew, or... you see, or a quilt, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I just can't. Come I can't on. Come on. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, that's so, my yeah. practical nature. I so just, can. You know, like, wow. But at the end of the day, here's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to open people's eyes to the value of human beings and that each one of us is different, but that we all contribute. And so but a, what a progressive organization does is it looks at the talent that's available to it and it says, how do I get the best out of this talent? Rather than saying, this is who we are, come in and conform to us. And that's the bottom line, really. Mm -hmm. So whether you call it diversity or inclusion or happiness or whatever. <laughs> I, whatever did you, you say happiness, I see this helium <laughs> cylinder in the balloons. Call it whatever you want. We're all doing the same thing or we're all trying to do the same well, thing. Well, we couldn't have said it any better. We want to thank you for joining us thank you, here on the pleasure. Focus Group as once the, again. As your top your, three. As your top Yay. three, but we'll find out the actual number and we will post it to our, okay. our Facebook page at, uh, at Focus Group Radio. It's Michelle Williams. She's the, I'm going to have you say the title because you have it down, <laughs> Senior. Senior Director of Diversity and Corporate Social Responsibility for Volkswagen Group of America. See how she does it so well. I could have <laughs> yes, said it too, but I'd have, I'd have stumbled what, it's through It's what we call media training. Media training. <laughs> media training. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to take a quick break. John and I are down here in Herndon, Virginia at the Volkswagen Group of America headquarters talking to our friends at Volkswagen. It's Diversity Week. It's also out in Equal Week. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, there's more focus groups. Stay with us. Brought to you by the seven-seater Volkswagen Atlas. Life's as big as you make it. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. And in business a week, I got more money and I know what to do with. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. Herrera Rocher. Yeah. He is doing well. Welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Tim Bennett. Focusgroupradio.com is our website, and that's where you'll find out all about our audio and video platforms. We're down in Herndon, Virginia, and we're at the Volkswagen headquarters. And we're now joined by David Bruce, who's the Vice President of Human Resources of Volkswagen Group of America, or Volkswagen of America. David, welcome. Good Thank to see you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Oh, we're shaking hands. Is that yeah. what we're doing? There we oh, go. Dang, New twist right. to the show. New twist to the show. show. We've never done now that I can before. do. There you go. <laughs> So David, um, I was looking at your resume and you have a master's in industrial relations? Correct, yes. Which at first I thought that meant that you might be an expert in dealing with union negotiations, but that's not exactly what that is, is it? It's the relationship of industry to employee, am Correct. I got that right? Correct, yes, yes. What, uh, what, what really that means and really where I spend most of my time uh, and energy is around connecting the, the talent and the workforce to the business. So as it relates to strategy, as it relates to programs, people development, uh, all of these issues have bottom line people implications, no matter what it is organizationally. And my job is to really to help to understand those, uh, those uh, implications and to kind of help leadership identify um, with the workforce as it relates to uh, introducing these uh, types of programs. So your Volkswagen 
You, can we call you Dave? Sure. All right. <laughs> Sometimes David. You know, you're, you're one of those guys with the people have always told you probably you have two first names. Or exactly. Two last names. I have a spare, like a spare tire. <laughs> I have two first names. So, the, um, so you're Volkswagen Group of America? Correct. And so for listeners out there that might not know, what, what brands does that entail? Well, a lot of people don't realize uh, Volkswagen Group of America is really a family of well-known brands. Uh, this can include not only the, the more recognizable uh, brands like Audi or Volkswagen, right. um, but also some of the more uh, interesting and exotic brands like um, Bentley, Lamborghini, or even uh, Ducati uh, Italian motorcycles. So we have all kinds of really uh, uh, interesting brands as well under that umbrella. So in your role in, in human resources, and you mentioned talent as John asked you that question, each of the brands has their own identity and their own culture. Yeah, personality. Right, and personality. Mm -hmm. so how, how, what's the challenge there for you in terms of finding talent? Do you, do you ever talk to somebody that might have come in for a job with Volkswagen and say, hmm, I wonder if they might be better over at Ducati? Or do you silo yourself? Yeah, well, it, it is uh, unique and interesting about our world here in Volkswagen Group of America because we have so many brands and each of those brands really has its own standalone identity. Um, and the brands are very strong uh, and, and many people identify with them in, in different ways. So when you look at the attributes of a, of a Bentley brand, for example, compared to a Volkswagen brand, um, they're very different customers, uh, very different brand attributes. Uh, and they appeal to uh, an entirely different world of, of, of people. So oftentimes when people come to work for us, you know, if it's not someone just saying, hey, I'll take, I'll take whatever job you have, a lot of people come to us saying, I wanna work for Audi. I wanna work for Volkswagen. I wanna be part of that brand. Their passion for the brand is such that they are absolutely. literally like, I gotta be a VW guy or I gotta be an Audi person. That can, that can absolutely happen. And, but, but you also then sometimes find that people will once they get into the organization, they like to kind of move between the brands and, and build on their career and development that way as well. Um, but the, the, the passion around these brands uh, is, is one of the top motivators of our, our workforce. People love being associated with them, they love working with them, and they love being a part of the brand stories in the U.S. So the, uh, the, jumping to the challenges of what you do, taking someone in, in and they mesh with the company, so I dropped my car off the other day to have a servicing all-track wagon. Mm -hmm. Love it. And I mentioned, I said, when the mechanic checks, could he look for, and the guy waved his hand, he goes, they're not mechanics, they're technicians. Mm -hmm. So in today's auto industry, where we no longer have mechanics, but we have software, we have IP design, we have, how is the challenge of working in HR to fill roles that are really non-traditional? Like you're, you're bringing in a lot of different people with a lot of, you, actually you said in an article recently that you, like a year ago, you're competing with software companies yes. even in terms of who you bring in. So what is that dynamic like? Well, it, it's interesting because, you know, from, from a timing standpoint uh, and a history standpoint, uh, your question is spot on because the auto industry is going through such a period of transformative change right now, uh, unlike we haven't seen in 40 years. Literally, we've, we've operated under the same basic business model for so long. Now we find ourselves um, in businesses like electric mobility, yeah. uh, 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 data, um, uh, onboard IT systems, uh, those types of things that traditionally have not been part of the normal um, uh, auto industry. So basically what we're finding is we're having to go out and find these skill sets from people who maybe didn't think of working for a Volkswagen group or for, for an Audi uh, or for one of these, yeah. these, these brands. Are their expectations a lot different though? Because if you grab somebody that um, might not have an auto background, so doesn't understand the way an auto company works because most of them are pretty much set up the same way as you mentioned. How does that affect if they had expectations of either time off or benefits and how, how things have changed that way? If they came from a company where they might have been flush with cash yeah. in terms of what benefits were. What, or, what, what company is that, by the way? The no, one but that's you, flush you talk with about cash, some of these right? tech companies where they, the kid's going to, or the, kid, the person's going to say, I'm getting stock options or I'm going to yes. maybe get mm. use of a car or I'm going to get to work on some great projects, but maybe I don't get family leave. It, it, so do you have to balance that? And is it across the portfolio or again, is that? Brand, brand specific, yeah. Well, no, it, those types of, of conditions and expectations uh, for people 
Um, you know, to, that number one, that's across all of our, our brands and business units. And, and remember, we're, we are uh, part of a 650,000 employee company globally. Um, globally. Yeah. So, you know, one of the, one of the things we found that people, uh, I said before about the connection, you know, and the energy associated with the brands, but one of the, the reasons that some of the top talent in the industry likes to come with us and stay with us is the ability to have impact on global change. Whether it's you know, at, at the, the, the global level or at the US level, um, people find that they are able to come into this company uh, regardless of the benefits. You know, all those things are comparable one way or the other. But they find that we have the scale, we have the ability, we have the know-how and the talent internally and the resources to make big things happen. And not everyone can say that in every, every industry or every business. So we've, we're finding more and more that as we try to uh, uh, attract and retain people from these you know, non-automotive industries, um, they come in and they like what they see and they like what they're able to do. And we find that you know, that's an important attractor for people and a motivator for them uh, in their careers. Is there, one thing I've always been fascinated by is exactly what you're talking about, where, but I'm gonna change it a little bit. So if skill sets are transferable, AKA a good problem solver in the software world is a good problem solver in an auto company, um, do you have to make that argument to some candidates? That you, like, let's say you have a candidate that you think is a prime person to either lead others or to be on a team and collaborate, and they're like, well, you know, this is fine, but I don't really do, like, so how's that, how do you actually make the final, like, get the brass ring? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, part of it is, you know, kind of selling the challenge and the opportunity as well. Um, because, you know, for certain types of, of uh, uh, workers out there and certain types of talent, you put in front of them uh, a challenge like, helping to transform a traditional industry like the automotive industry into this new world, okay? Into this kind of a whole new economy, this whole new approach to them is sometimes irresistible. When they, when the they say, it's it's, yeah, it's one thing to go to work for an Apple or a Google or you know, one of these uh, companies, you know what you're getting and you know what they'll be doing and so forth. But when people, when they see what they could potentially do with our company and to be part of, that scale of transformation, uh, it's a very powerful uh, attractor for people. And with your, so part of the reason we're down here visiting is uh, the Out and Equal Conference is happening this, uh, this week in Seattle. But uh, we wanted to come and talk to you guys as our partner here on the focus group. And aside from as big as you, you talk about the organization, the importance that you guys place on either diversity or inclusion and how do you make sure that you're also doing that while you're trying to do all the other things that you mentioned and, and the importance of it within the organization? How, is that under your area? Absolutely. Um, and one of the, uh, to me, that is uh, one of the, the best outcomes of the, the transformational change that we're going through as an organization right now is that we're, we're kind of reinventing our traditional workforce, you know, in, in terms of how it looks, where we, where we recruit from, um, and how we build that workforce in, in terms of bringing, you know, uh, people with, with new thinking, new backgrounds, new interests, um, new competencies, and it kind of opens uh, windows for us that we haven't had traditionally. Um, and when I, you know, when I started with this company, it was in a suburb of Detroit. And you know the the traditional recruitment is you open your door and you shout out to the other auto you know companies <laughs> and the same group of people Revolving tends to door. move uh, yeah. who, move who around. You bring out your dead. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and you know one of the the main reasons we originally relocated our headquarters from Southeast Michigan in uh, um, 2008 was to uh, expand and diversity diversify. The thought and experience of our workforce, and we were we were literally looking for people that weren't in the automotive industry before, because we needed wow. new thinking, we needed new ideas, uh, we needed new perspectives in the in the company, and that really opened our eyes to a diversity and inclusion. And here and I thought it was because Dulles had more flights to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you came here for flights There is to a Germany. utilitarian <laughs> quality to the I guess decision. Detroit and I do Detroit appreciate has them that. Too, though. Detroit them, does yeah. have them too. I've been on them all, believe me. But, uh, 
Yes, but you, it, it can all be, um, and I, I guess in the spirit of transparency, I, I worked for another automotive brand and uh, was part of the, the team that was trying to um, implement a lot of diversity programs and inclusion programs. And there was pushback at times, and I remember the struggle trying to figure out uh, how you balance that. And I'm sure you probably run into that with an organization as big as you guys are. How, how do you convince somebody who might not be on board with saying, listen, this is the way we need to move forward. This is good for the company in general. Is it a carrot or a stick? <laughs> <laughs> do you lead them along? Is, or there, I, I read that you might have done, you might do surveys or you might have yeah. some third, third party empirical data that says, you know what, this is, you might not necessarily agree with this, but this is, this makes sense from a business point of view. Yeah. So, you know, it is like many things, it's, it's, it's part carrot and part stick, but you know, what we, where we've kind of uh, enjoyed the most success in moving along uh, uh, programs around diversity and inclusion, it's where we've been able to identify a, a um, strong, sustainable business case. That, you know, the world we're living in is moving so fast and the, the competition is so intense uh, right now in this industry that the companies that are, that are gonna be jumping out ahead are the ones more often open to new thought, new perspectives, new ideas, uh, an entirely new idea of what workforce and talent looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so we, re we now realize, and, and we're, we're slowly, and we, we haven't figured it all out. You know, Not right. every company has, and, and there's a lot of areas where we see and would like to see ourselves improve. Um, <clears throat> but for the most part, we are seeing that you know, the companies that are stuck in you know, old world, uh, old industry thinking um, are going to be the ones left behind. And, you know, when we, when we see successful companies that have really, really engaged their leadership um, and have really introduced these real living ideas around diversity and inclusion in their strategies and their workforce and in their leadership, we see success. And, you know, there's one thing we, we like in this company. It's, uh, it's understanding what success looks like uh, you know, how do we get that success? How do we compare against that success? And I think we're, we're, we're really coming around to realize is that, you know, these are, these are modern ideas and sensibilities that we, we cannot continue to compete if we don't make this part of our strategy and our workforce. Excellent. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Do you drive a Volkswagen or do you drive something else? I do. No. <laughs> you know, I do. I, I, dri I drive a Golf Meaning all track wagon. I thought, I thought maybe you had a a, uh, an all-track driver. I'm yeah. an all-track driver, too. We have three all-track all drivers. We're all-track <laughs> drivers. Uh, and that, that uh, you know, I love the Golf family. Yeah, I, uh, I do, too. You know, I the, the, too. the Golf family is the, the greatest. Uh, to me, it's the perfect world car. You know, and, it, and it, we have all these, you know, variations and everything. But at the end of the day, whether you like a sporty GTI, uh, or you like a, a golf track, uh, or a all track wagon, uh, it's got something for everyone. Well, I had a CC before, and then John John loved the, the sport wagon, so now we both have yeah. the, the all track wagon. So Excellent, so all three it. of us then. So, hey, thanks for joining us. It's, it's Thank you. Uh, uh, David Bruce, he's Vice President of Human Resources at the Volkswagen Group of America. John and I are here in Herndon. We're gonna take a quick break. Stay tuned, we've got some more from the Focus Group. Brought to you by the Volkswagen Tiguan. Visit VW.com to learn more. You're listening to The Focus Group. I said to my girlfriend just the other day, monsters are interesting, I said. With Tim Bennett and John Nash. And I'll bet you meet a lot of interesting people, too. Welcome back to The Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us today. Thanks to all the employees of Volkswagen. Thank you to Deep Discount. Again, uh, biography sale this month. I picked The Lost City of Z. Uh, Tim picked a great collection, uh, the Royal Collection. It's a box set. And uh, Barry was the new release. And um, I say check it out because it's gotten great reviews from all my friends. And I'm telling you to check it out. And a big, big thank you again to Volkswagen Group of America. They've been with us for over nine years. And um, we had a great time down in Herndon. And you'll see everything. If you just rewind, if you pick me up right now, just rewind to that section and you'll see it. So everybody, don't text and drive alive arrive. And Tim has a new one that he saw on the Jersey Transit. It's about text, head up. Oh, heads up. 
Eyes front, heads up. Eyes uh, eyes front, heads yeah. up. So in other words, don't look. No, okay. phones down, heads up. Yeah, that's it. See you next week. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group. <laughs>